Jackson, known as the Lockevore Hunter from his blog, uh, is going to talk to us a bit today about his uh, approach to hunting as a form of, um, as a co contributor to the local food movement, but also as a form of environmental conservation. He has, his work has been featured in his hunting curriculum, has been discussed in the New York Times, in the Washington Post, Time Magazine, and he is also most recently the author of Eating Aliens, uh, a very interesting book that features prominently in his talk today, and which is on sale in the back of the room and will be available for signature um, if you all are interested at the end of the talk. I want to thank Brown College for making this possible. I want to thank Chris Ostakanis in the back there for all of her help in making this possible. I also want to just a uh, brief warning, there's going to be some imagery, I think nothing too, too um, Rough, overwhelming, nothing, nothing out of West Grade, no. um, but some imagery of hunting and related activities for those who are sensitive to it, that's something to keep in mind. So enjoy and welcome to Jackson Landers. Thank you. Somehow, in the space of a few short years, I went from uh, working as a wholesale insurance broker to a situation where this was sort of a day at work uh, in the office. And it's kind of um, uh, an unusual story that I think uh, reveals a little bit about how uh, hunting has become more integrated into uh, not only the local food movement, but into you know, mainstream conservation. Or, or uh, It's always, actually hunting in America has always been very tied to, uh, to conservation for the last century. But I, I think it's a, it's a story that's sort of um, illuminating. Uh, I actually uh, grew up in a vegetarian household. Uh, I did not, I don't think I ate chicken until I was somewhere between 10 and 12 years old. And, um, and while we didn't eat meat while I was growing up, uh, you know, I discovered when I was out on my own that I really liked steak, I really liked burgers. It was all stuff that I liked to eat. And uh, when I was a kid, well, uh, you know, we, um, we didn't have meat around, but we did all sorts of other, other cooking. And, you know, we didn't have, uh, you know, if I wanted a cookie, it wasn't going to be, well, you know, we're going to open a bag of Chips Ahoy or something. You know, uh, maybe someone would bake the cookies or just as likely it was, okay, well, here's the recipe card, you know, uh, get to work. And so, you know, I learned how to, uh, it was just a household where we cooked things from scratch, and that was sort of what you know uh, I took for granted. And, but you know, when I was out on my own as an adult, I tried cooking with meat and realized that was something that was part of my culinary education that was not there at all. I had no idea what to do with. Like I remember the first time I bought a steak, and I opened it up and took it out of the plastic, and I looked, and I was like, "What am I going to do with this hunk of?" dead tissue. I didn't want to touch it with my bare hands. In fact, I, I, until I started uh, actually hunting and butchering, I would not touch meat with my bare hands. I would take it, you know, I'd have a fork and hold it at the end of the fork or some tongs and I'd kind of put it in the marinade like that. And then after it was cooked, somehow magically, because it's been seared uh, by fire, I'm going to put this in my mouth? It didn't, it didn't make any sense, you know. And as time went by, it seemed more and more like hypocrisy to me. Uh, every time I would eat meat that I was so uncomfortable with what this dead thing was, but I was still going to put it in my mouth. It, it didn't make any sense. And so uh, a few different things came together at the same time, and, and I decided that for me, I, was, I needed to uh, hunt, kill, and butcher uh, something and to confront where the meat came from. And I don't hold this out as something everyone else does. I don't think other people are terrible people if they decide to eat meat or not meat, eat meat or, or uh, kill things or not kill. It's just this was something that I needed to do. Uh, so I decided that I was going to, um, to, to learn how to do this. And um, I figured going into this experience, well, me either, if I, if I could succeed in doing it, you know, 50-50 chance that maybe I would just end up saying I can't do this anymore and I'm going to be a veg vegetarian again. As it turned out, I was pretty okay with it. And uh, it would, took me a long time to learn how to do this. What I found was the whole stereotype of hunters, you know, that we get from Hollywood was sort of wrong. Where, okay, you got these guys that pull up in a pickup truck and they're half drunk and they wander into the woods and they sit in a treehouse and a deer goes by and they shoot it and it magically drops down dead, you know, and they drag it in the pickup truck and go home and hey, it's that easy. How hard could it be? Well, it turns out these guys that, you know, I'd had this stereotype about really knew a lot more than, than I thought. I struck, long story short, I struck out my first season. And, uh, uh, I decided that I was going to learn how to, I, I, I was just going to go crazy with this. I had to get a deer. And, uh, and actually, the, the, what really drove me to, uh, 
to, to probably push harder than I might have otherwise was the first time I took a shot at a deer, um, I was what they call the dreaded um, single lung shot. The bullet went through one lung of the deer. I didn't really know what I was doing. I was out there on my own and um, the, I tracked the deer for probably a mile and a half. It crossed a number of property lines and uh, I couldn't find it. And it, um, it broke my heart. It was awful. I, thought, I, I did this wrong and I wanted to do it right. And as I walked back to where I had started when I shot the deer, I reached down on the ground and I picked up a spent shell casing and I decided from, from the shot that I'd taken and put it in my pocket and said, it's staying in my pocket until I do this right. And so every time I would, you know, I'd be at work, I'd reach in my pocket to, you know, get out some, you know, uh, uh, cash to buy lunch. I would feel that, that shell casing in my pocket, you know, or I'd reach for my car key. So every day it was this reminder that I've got to do this right. And so not knowing any other hunters, I, I went to the science. Uh, I read hundreds of collar studies, of, you know, studies by biologists tracking deer movements against, you know, different uh, uh, weather fronts and temperature and, and phases of the moon and all that sort of thing. And uh, I, I read ecology textbooks, and uh, every time there was a dead deer that I had an opportunity to do something with, I looked at that as a, as a, um, a dissection opportunity. And when it was time to butcher, I, you know, I read up on, well, I didn't have a lot of butchering tools, so I studied, you know, how, how, do, they, how do they butcher a, 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 you know, a, a, a goat in central Mexico with just a knife, you know, and no refrigeration, you know, how do they do that? And after a while, I had a pretty good system down. I got to the point where I could go out and, um, uh, you know, say, I need to be here at this time. I'd sit down for 10, 15 minutes, deer would walk out, I'd shoot it, and then the real work would start. And it became a real important part of just, you know, uh, how I ate and how I survived. You know, one deer, that would be even a small deer, I'm gonna get 40 pounds of meat from that. You know, that's offsetting groceries by like 300 bucks that month. You know, it became a real important part of my survival. Then Michael Pollan happened. I'm sure everybody here knows who Michael Pollan is. He wrote The Omnivore's Dilemma. And all of a sudden, people read about that pig hunt. Everybody wanted to learn how to hunt for food. And people would ask me, well, Jackson, how'd you learn how to do this? I said, well, here's a couple hundred collar studies and uh, <laughs> you know, spend a, a few uh, uh, weeks out there just staring at deer and you know, you'll get there. But nobody wanted to do that. Well, I had a little bit of teaching experience. So I thought, well, what if I, if I teach a class about hunting uh, for food, would anybody be interested? And uh, I think about an hour later, the class was full. I had uh, uh, TV networks asking me to come and do interviews to talk about. I thought, well, I don't even have a curriculum yet. Uh, so I actually went out, it was like the Charlottesville Newsplex asked me to come out and do an interview. And I had experience in politics. I was used to talking to the press. I didn't think much of it. So I went and did the interview and I went home and I realized oh, a couple hundred thousand people are gonna see me or tens of thousands, whatever, people are gonna see me doing this interview where I said I'm gonna teach this class. I'd better do it and I better be good or I'm gonna look really stupid. So I, uh, I, I put a curriculum together and I started teaching. And um, very quickly, uh, it, just, it just caught on. I had the New York Times came out and spent three days with me and did a cover story on it. And, um, and that's how um, the group classes that I started doing began to come together. I had so many different types of people that would, uh, that, that would come out and learn how to do this. And the idea sort of spread. And once the New York Times had done an article on it, I was getting 300 emails a day from people uh, all over the world who wanted to learn how to do this. And I had people, I had to compress my class into a two day weekend class. I had people coming in from, I had one guy who came from Taiwan uh, and uh, TV offers and all sorts of things like this. Um, and actually, a lot of my alumni have, since they send me emails sometimes and a picture of a deer and a thank you, a lot of these people have, have since uh, managed to become successful as hunters. Uh, you know, the focus all along was really on, on food. And in fact, um, the young woman, her face isn't in here, uh, holding the rifle. She, uh, she's actually a pretty good example of a type of um, student that I had quite a lot of. Uh, she was a, um, a graduate student at um, George Mason University who was studying um, hunters and she was incognito. She was a vegan and she showed up, for, signed up for the class and she was there to try to study hunters actually. And she had a sort of an anti, she was, she was, she was undercover, she was trying to get some dirt. But she went through this whole process and I didn't know this at the time that she was <coughs> undercover, that she was a vegan. Uh, and she went through the whole process and uh, you know, we taught her how to shoot and we had a fresh uh, deer on the ground that she learned how to butcher and she ended up partic participating in that and that and then you know, we uh, did the finished butchering in a kitchen and we cooked it and um, I, w I had a, a chef from uh, uh, Brooklyn who had come down to take the class and he, he does like speakeasy type dinners in Brooklyn and he took the, uh, the liver which I hate, I hate liver, but he took this liver and he made, uh, from the deer and he made liver and onions and the f by sheer force of smell, she actually ate it. 
And then she told me like a week later that, okay, she, she was a vegan and <laughs> she'd eaten. Uh, so there, I don't think there's any better um, uh, endorsement of a chef's cooking skills than, you know, getting a vegan to fall off the wagon uh, just by for sheer force of smell. But it, pretty much every class I've taught since then has at least one, sometimes several, uh, practicing vegans and vegetarians. And I don't, we don't really have a good word for it yet, but these people are fitting uh, hunting into their way of, you know, their, their whole way of eating where, okay, it doesn't, it's, it, they won't eat meat, but if they kill it themselves, then it's just a different category. Because it's, it's a way, much, just like being a vegetarian, hunting for your own food is a way of dropping out of the factory meat paradigm. So I don't know if that you call these call them a movement or what, but there's certainly quite a lot of uh, of uh, vegetarians and vegans trying to hunt for food now. Uh, so out of all, all these classes, these hundreds of people who um, who took my classes, I wrote. Um, uh, from the curriculum of my first book, The Beginner's Guide to Hunting Deer for Food, which was intended to be, uh, I'm pretty sure this was the first um, book for, uh, for adult beginners learning how to hunt, because before this, you know, nobody, uh, until a few years ago, you either grew up in a household that hunted and you learned from older relatives, you had no interest in it at all. And so since then, the book has been a great success. <coughs> it's become basically, it's the basic text for if you want to learn how to hunt deer as a, as a beginner. Um, so, out of um, when I had this this first book done, um, the my, my book on hunting deer, I I didn't want to just write how-to books forever. I knew that I wanted to uh, to make writing into uh, into a career, and I'd, my, most of my life I'd look for I'd, I hope there'd be a way to do this, and this was sort of what I stumbled into. And I started looking at um, what are other things that I could do with my skills as a hunter that would be just empirically uh, uh, a an environmental good. You know, there's in the way I, I thought about, it, I realized you know the my rock bottom value, uh, as far as a, a ecology and conservation goes, is prevention of extinctions. We have so many different competing interests when we talk about, you know, uh, about environmentalism. You know, do you um, uh, are you going to manage a, a piece of land so that um, oops. Uh, are you going to manage a piece of land so that you can have a whole lot of something, com uh, something common at the expense of something that's, that's maybe very rare? Uh, there are so many different things to weigh. And really, when I'm trying to make a judgment about, about environmental policy, I always think, okay, is there an extinction at risk? And that's what I want to, uh, to prevent. And I thought, well, there's really three major factors that I see contributing to this incredible wave of extinction that's going on on Earth right now that is, has not ha we haven't had anything like this in, a, you know, in tens of millions of years at least. Uh, and so I saw global warming, okay, that's a, that's a big issue. There's a lot of people and organizations doing something about that, and God bless them, but I don't know how much I have to add to that. Uh, loss of habitat, a lot of organizations doing something about that. The Nature Conservancy does great work, uh, so does uh, you know, Ducks Unlimited and Trout Unlimited, and there are a lot of organizations that are trying to protect habit habitat. Well, the third thing I saw was the effect of invasive species. And, uh, but I didn't really, I looked around, I, didn't, I saw, saw a lot of people talking about invasive species and a lot of people studying invasive species, but I didn't see a whole lot of systematic work to, to, um, to remove them. And I thought, well, okay, I'm pretty good at killing stuff and talking about it and teaching people how to, and writing about how to do this. Well, maybe, you know, maybe I could do some work with invasive species. And so I conceived of my second book, which is, was Eating Aliens.